Welcome to the first of our webinars presented by Dr. Marianne Dorn, the rehab vet. Marianne qualified in veterinary medicine from Edinburgh University in 1996, and she's worked for many years in small animal practice. In 2014, she got a postgraduate certificate in small animal rehabilitation through the University of Nottingham. Since then, she's worked as the rehab vet. Many of you may well have visited the website. If you do a search for the rehab vet, by Marianne's website. She assesses and helps patients with orthopedic and, ortho and neurological conditions. She has a special interest in finding practical solutions for dogs with invertebral disc disease. The presentation will run for about 50 minutes, maybe 55 minutes. And we will be happy to take some questions and Marianne will answer those at the end. Thank you all very much for joining us this evening. Your, 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 your fee for the session will be donated to Jackson Health UK and the Red Foundation as part of our Dactober fundraising month. So I'm going to hand over to Marianne now. Uh, have a great evening and I'll look forward to catching up with everybody at the question and answer session at the end of today. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. That's a, a very great introduction. Thanks a lot. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, so um, as Ian said, I'm both a vet and a physiotherapist. I've got a really practical background with helping these dogs learn to walk and helping their owners through this really challenging time. Um, so today we're going to talk about some practical tips. I'm going to give you practical tips, but to start with, before we get into the practical tips, we'll just have a little quick refresher on what IVDD is. Uh, next slide. So um, IVDD stands for intervertebral disc disease, and we'll have a look at what happens in the spine in just a moment. Um, and these dogs, they tend to be painful when the condition first starts. Um, and very commonly it affects Dachshunds, such as this chap here, French Bulldogs, such as this dog, and can also affect many particularly small breed dogs. Um, and this can happen when they're quite young, um, young adults. Um, but the commonest age is between around about four to six years to go down at, uh, with this condition, but it can happen as early as two years old, even sometimes in younger adults than that. And older dogs can get it as well. Um, and dogs can be affected relatively mildly or much more severely. And today we're talking about dogs that can't walk with this condition. So all of them are affected quite severely. Um, the chap on the left, this is Walter. And in the picture, he can walk, but he's not walking normally. And this is typical of dogs with IVDD. They stagger around. Um, they may look rather like a drunk person as they're walking. Um, Walter here is crossing his hind paws over as he walks. Um, and the other thing you may see these dogs do is walk or stand with their paws upside down. And that's called knuckling. And that's never normal in a dog. Um, uh, and if they're even more severely affected, they may be unable to get up at all. So this dog on the right, who's a, a Dachshund crossbreed, um, completely paralyzed in his hind quarters, unable to get up. So he's just trying to move around like a seal with his, with his hind legs uh, dragging behind him. So these are all things we see with um, IVDD. Um, let's have a quick look at what's happening to cause this problem. So here's my diagram of a Dachshund skeleton. Um, and of course, all dogs have, have got a similar skeleton. We've, we've just got a, a much longer back here. Um, and we've got the spine along here made up of bones called vertebrae. And this spine, it protects the spinal cord. Spinal cord runs all the way along and it contains um, long nerve cells and they carry information from the brain through the, to, uh, through the, through the spine, out through uh, 
nerves to the rest of the body. So there's information being carried from the brain along the spine and all the way back and to the hind legs. And there's information carried from the hind legs up the spine to the, to the brain again. And this allows dogs to control their walking. So if we have a problem in the middle of the dog's back, that can interrupt the communication between the brain and the hind legs. And Dachshunds and certain other breeds do get this problem very commonly in this area, uh, the lumbar area of the spine. They can also get it in their neck. And if they get it in their neck, that then they may move um, strangely with all four feet or even be unable to get up on any of their feet. Uh, let's have a look at what's happening inside the spine. So the spine is made up of these individual bones. We've got th uh, in this diagram, we've got three bones of the spine, three vertebrae, one, two, three. Um, and in this diagram, we've got discs in between the vertebrae. So dogs have got um, discs between their vertebrae, just like we have. Um, and in this diagram, they're drawn in blue here and here and here and they cushion the spine as the dog moves. And they're made largely of cartilage. And in Dachshunds and French Bulldogs and some other breeds, these discs degenerate early in life. Even in those dogs that look like they're going around normally, they actually have uh, discs that are different to other breeds of dog in early life. They start to dry out, especially the, the center of the disc starts to dry out and this puts means that um, abnormal forces go through the outer part of the disc and then that may tear and rupture um, and the center of the disc can sort of splurge through so it splurges through a gap in the outer part of the disc and if the center of the disc sort of splurges or explodes upwards it can hit the spinal cord or press against the spinal cord which is here drawn in white it can damage the spinal cord and that's what stops that communication, those messages getting from the brain to the dog's hindquarters. So when this happens, some dogs are treated with spinal surgery, some dogs don't have surgery, whichever option is chosen. These dogs will come home at some point and need to finish their recovery. And many of them come home to start with unable to walk. Um, so they need special care. And just uh, we're not going to cover all of home care in this talk. It's just too much to do within uh, within a short time. But just a, a, just a quick recap. Um, yes, they need to be confined, these dogs, for safety to start with and for other reasons, which we'll go into later. So they do get put into a crate or pen to recover. Um, they still need to get out to the toilet. Life goes on and they actually need to get out to pee and to poo. It needs to be supervised. They must be on the lead. And this is a painful condition. Um, they'll have prescribed painkillers to come home with. Now we can get on to our practical tips. And of course, do ask me if you've got questions, write them down or put them in the chat so we can talk about them at the end. So first tip is for, for to encourage your dog to start walking again. Firstly, get your dog up onto all four paws. Do this using a sling, but also use a lead and harness. Let's look at how we do this. So there are various types of sling you can use. Um, the, the, um, what all of these dogs have in common is that they're being supported in a position that makes them look like a dog on all four paws. They're not just flopped on the ground. Um, in this little dog up here, this is Darcy Doolittle. Um, and in uh, what, what they're doing here, they've improvised a sling using a scarf so that they're just using that to hold her back end up. She's a standard dachshund and that's just a lady's scarf. Um, if you have a miniature dachshund, you might get away with using a fluffy toweling bathrobe belt. 
um, especially if they still have a little bit of function in their hind end and are not too collapsed. Um, better than that, a more permanent solution, a sort of longer term solution than that would be to get a purpose made sling that goes onto the belly, like this one or this one. Um, these are better because they've got adjustable handles, so you don't need to stoop over when you're helping your dog with, with walking. Um, these slings, these two here, are from a fantastic charity called Dedicated to Dachshunds. They do great work, they give some basic advice, they give some, uh, some support, and they, very importantly, they loan out equipment for Dachshunds in the UK. Um, and um, so they loan out these slings. If you own a different breed in the UK, you could buy one from their uh, get in touch on their on their Facebook page. So these are just slings that go onto the belly. And there's another type of sling. Um, we call this a hip lift sling, and it just fits around the hind legs, which can be very um, it can be very good for the dog. It can it can really support their back end just where the support is needed. Um, they can be a little bit fiddly to put on, uh, but once you've got the hang of it, they are useful. Um, I generally find they're not essential in small breeds, but I definitely would use a hip lift type sling for a large breed because it supports them where that support is most needed. Ah, oh, and here we have Bert moving along. Um, so just giving you an idea of how how they're supported and um, we'll look at the technique of this in a moment so a key thing when you're helping your dog with a sling really top tip is slow their front end down so that their hind paws have a chance to step so dogs are clever little creatures and when their hind legs are weak what they will often do as a cheat is to scrabble forwards faster with their front legs and if you're not careful they'll whiz forward with their front legs and they'll make you do all the work supporting their back end they won't even attempt to step properly with their hind legs and they won't recover so well so slow their front end down we do that using a lead of course and the best thing to attach that lead to is a harness now in an if your dog's just gone down and it's in an emergency, you can attach the lead to a collar. Um, but then I do recommend you get a harness because a collar is really going to press on the delicate structures of their neck. The neck is an extension of the spine and it's got the windpipe and other delicate structures in there. So it's best not to put lots of pressure on that. Um, instead, a good harness um, puts most of the pressure on the dog's breastbone or keel. And that's a really good place to put pressure because that's not a very sensitive area, um, sort of bone and cartilage, and it, the dog's nice and strong there. So I recommend finding a harness if you can with a, 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 a the front should be shaped like a capital Y like this. That's best. Um, this one is very adjustable. It's got sliding adjusters all the way round um, and it should fit quite snugly so that there isn't so much wiggle room they can get a paw through of course and so that the messages from your lead get straight through to the dog without this whole harness just wobbling about um, also think about which lead you're using again in an in an emergency just use what you have and okay, what is um, your last name again ma'am sorry somebody's talking <clears throat> and first name um, right, I'm going to I'm going to ignore that. Um, so yeah, choosing a lead, we've got um, yeah. So what I recommend you do is just go for a simple lead without any stretchy bit to it. So not a bungee section. It's just it must have a clip, so you can clip that clip onto a harness. Um, and I recommend that you avoid extendable leads like this, even if you set them to a fixed length. Um, that this handle is really unwieldy and awkward and it's not going to give you the fine control you need to, to really get um, your dog walking in a balanced way. So 
fixed length lead, just a, a normal lead, not the extendable one. Now, here's how I recommend you use that lead and sling. Hold the lead in one hand and the sling in the other hand. And there's a reason for this. Um, the reason is that the two, the two things do, they have different roles. So that lead is going to be your brakes to slow the dog down if they're rushing forward. Remember, you want to slow down their front end so their hind paws have a chance to step. Um, so that lead is generally going to be acting backwards a little bit to slow your dog. And the sling, on the other hand, is going to be mainly acting upwards to support them just enough so they don't fall. Let's have a look at this dog. His name's Atty. So he's had an operation. He's having a go at walking. I think he's actually stopping for a, for a little pee here, which is so important. It's really good his owner stopped with him there. Do let your dog stop and do what they need to do. It's nice to see him shaking. Now you will find they make really they may make really slow progress and like they're not he's not going very far and he's stopping a lot and this is fine because actually he's getting some practice standing he's just sniffing the air he's 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 had his pee and he's going to get going again when he's ready and he's he's wobbly but he's really making an effort to walk so he does have some function so the key things here are let your dog go slowly stop when they stop uh, let's go on. Let's go on to our next big tip. Consider what motivates your dog and use that to get them uh, moving. Every dog is different. So if you want to set them up for success, um, think about what's going to really motivate them. Now, to start with, you know, safety first, don't overdo things. Um, I do recommend when they're walking, uh, short grass is a great surface. That's um, a fairly easy surface for them to walk on and they're not going to scrape their paws on it. Um, you saw in the previous clip the other dog was walking a little bit on concrete and he was doing fine with that. That can also be good. But if your dog is just dragging their feet, don't use the concrete. Just keep the soft ground like uh, shortcut grass. Long cut grass is just too difficult for them to walk to walk on um, when they're first learning. So short cut grass or it, it, whatever's around where you are, it might just be sort of compacted, slightly soft earth. Um, it might be sand. Um, now, setting them up for success, considering what really motivates your dog. So many dogs are motivated by food. <laughs> um, many dogs just want to get outside they're really keen to go and explore their territory. This dog actually wants to go and have a snooze in bed. And many dogs are like this. So it, it depends on what the dog's personality is. Um, if your dog's in that situation, they just want to go home. Um, what I recommend you do is carry them a little way across the lawn and face them towards the house. And then they might have a go at marching back towards the house with you slowing them from the lead. That way, they're likely to take better steps than if they're going in a direction they don't want to go in. Now, this looks like a really long distance. Um, believe you me, it wasn't. It's the camera angle, so don't overdo it. Um, as a general rule, don't do more than five minutes at a time, absolutely maximum, um, when you're sling walking. And you may need to do even less than that. Um, here's an example of a dog on a f uh, going along a food trail. So this is another way to get them motivated. I, I wouldn't do this on day one or two, but if you've got a really lazy dog and they've actually been doing some recovering and now they need to have a go at walking, um, you could put out a food trail. So this is little bits of chicken breast. It's quite low calorie. <laughs> and that's what's motivating this dog. Yes, he's barely stepping, but this was the best function we had seen by far up to that point. It was the food that got him motivated. And then the owner's job is actually to really slow him down 
from that harness um we're looking at the dog rather than the owner but you you can actually see she's actually sort of lifting him a little bit from this harness as well because what he's trying to do is to throw his weight down and forward so she's slowing him and if needed she's even lifting a bit from that front harness and she's just supporting enough at the back end so that he doesn't fall when they're learning to walk little and often is best um, it's just you know when you're learning anything that involves muscles working you have to do it little little bits at a time otherwise you get very severe muscle fatigue um, so I think of it as a, a little bit like you know I'm, I'm a very unfit person if you tell me to go and if you were to tell me to go and do some press-ups please don't ask me to do that um, but I would find it very difficult I might get to maybe three and then really start struggling and maybe if you made me do 10, my muscles would turn to jelly, I would collapse. Um, and I would need to have maybe maybe three minutes, maybe five minutes of complete rest, and then maybe I could do another three. Well, it's the same with these dogs. And actually, it's more so for these dogs because they had completely lost their nerve supply or lost a lot of their nerve supply to those muscles their muscles really need to recover and they're going to fatigue incredibly quickly. Um, so that five minutes of lead of vert uh, sling walking is an absolute maximum and you may need to do much less. Sometimes we find it's best to do one minute and then stop and lift your dog up or let them rest on the ground and then do another minute, especially if they're just starting to make progress that week starting to move their legs um give them give them breaks one way to give them breaks is to have a push chair dog dog push chairs um as a general rule i'm happy for people to use these from around two weeks into recovery or two weeks after surgery for some dogs it could even be sooner than that but check with your vet first uh, a couple of safety issues you can see here these dogs are clipped in from their harness um, this dog's got bolsters on the side so if they're a bit unsteady on their feet that's going to make things easier um, and the beauty of a push chair is you can actually take your dog to places that they'd, they'd like to go somewhere where they're more motivated perhaps somewhere where they can sniff their old favorite smells <laughs> near their old favorite lamppost or their old favorite tree and just get them out for that tiny little bit that one minute two minutes maybe five minutes of sling walking and then pop them back in the push chair for a rest <laughs> let them read their p-mails so dogs see the world differently to us and the smells on the ground they're like social media <laughs> to a dog they can smell where other dogs have been. They can smell where they've been. They can, you know, then they know what wildlife has been there and they can add to it when they feel ready. Um, so this is a dog recovered, uh, you know, enough not to be using a sling for the photo. But even when your dog is using a sling, let them stop and sniff. And that will help them start to actually learn to pee again more normally. And it's really good for their mental well-being. Um, just drop a note in here about uh, this book that's now available because it is full of practical tips and a lot more. So, we, you know, we've, we've just gone through a bit to do with sling walking. Uh, the book covers lots of techniques, including sling walking, lots and lots of other techniques that you may need during your dog's recovery. It also covers some home physiotherapy, including exercises, massage if you need to do that lots of details and setting up their their recovery area their crate or their pen there's some general information about the condition and decision making which is there to back up what your vet is discussing with you and just to explain it a bit more um, there's an appendix there are several appendices at the back uh, one of them has got routines suitable for different types of dog or different situations and you can adapt them for your own dog um, and prompts and when to see the vet. So it's a it's a really practical um, resource. 
um, if you've got a dog that can't walk, the best place to start in that book, I would say, is section three, dogs that cannot walk. It's an overview of advice. Um, so it just, you know, it gives you some kind of safety advice and some boxes and different things and pictures, and it sends you to the relevant bits of the book so you can find out more details. So let's go on to tip number three. I'll tell you now, there are, ten, there are six tips in this talk, so we're getting there. Tip number three, cover any slick flooring. Non-slip mats are useful. And by the way, I've backed all these little tip headings with grass because I think, you know, grass is so important in the dog's world, at least in this country. It is a lovely grippy surface for dogs to walk on, to learn to walk on, and they they like to be taken outside in those little short trips outside and to sniff the ground. But indoors, sometimes the flooring can be treacherous. So check your flooring. Here we've got quite a slick parquet wooden flooring. This is completely unsuitable for dogs recovering from IVDD. Um, they'll find it very difficult to learn to walk on here. And what they'll tend to do is to um, pull themselves forward with their front legs, maybe even drag themselves across or try and scoot across. Now these various rugs, they might be suitable to stand the dog on uh, with some restraint, but only if they have some um, rubber backing to them or something non-slip underneath. Otherwise, you'll find these rugs themselves are just going to slip over the, the flooring uh, when your dog starts to move. So if you've got a floor like that or if you've got slick tiles or really any wooden floor, definitely laminate floor, which is very, very slick. Um, most hard floors are too slick. So if you have slick floors, um, I suggest that you put down some runners um, to start with, you know, you'll be just simply carrying your, your, your dog out over any slick flooring and, and taking them out. But um, if you, uh, once you get past that stage and they're a little bit stronger and they may be ready to actually walk from the pen across the room with your help and then you can lift them over the doorstep and then you can uh, let them help them walk over the grass outdoors. Now, for them to walk across the room or through the hallway, put down runners, non slip runners. Um, you can get runners by the meter online quite cheaply and easily in various colors. Uh, there are all kinds of runners and rugs and things at the market if, you, if you're lucky enough to have one near you. Um, you can improvise. So this is a yoga mat. They make a really good grippy surface. Um, so at a pinch, you could use old yoga mats. You could use doormats. Um, that's actually a bath mat, which can be great if they have a good non-slip backing to them. Um, and that kind of fluffy surface is a, it's quite nice to stand and walk on for the dog. So here are a couple of setups. I know we're talking about learning to walk. This is kind of further along. I thought I'd show you these two because these are dogs who've learned to walk. They're well into their recovery, around about six, seven or eight weeks into recovery. Uh, this chap on the left and this one on the right, I think was even further down the line. He'd, he'd really recovered. That was a, a good couple of months or, or longer after his operation. Um, the nice thing about this picture, so this dog is just gradually transitioning to being in the pen all day to starting to be allowed to wander in the room. And his owner has put down runner for him and there's a big rug here. And the other thing she's done is just put a stair gate across this door because what we don't want is when he's wandering, perhaps somebody might ring on the doorbell or there might be a, an order, a delivery at the door. And what we don't want is him trying to run, turn the corner and run down the hallway. Um, the, the, the hurrying off is a bad idea and also the turning suddenly and many hallways are slick as well. So just having that stair gate there makes this a much more practical, safe setup for him. 
Um, and in this case, it's a lovely little flat and they have put down uh, rugs that they're happy with because this, this is going to be a long term solution for this dog and he knows to step on the rugs. He's a clever boy. So tip number four, we want to help them learn to walk. Don't let them learn the wrong thing. Don't let them learn to drag if you can help it. It's a really difficult habit to unlearn. Let's have a look at a, a video of a dog dragging herself. And it can be quite hard work actually to drag over grass. It's something dogs actually learn to do. And this dog early in recovery was just put on the grass um, and she quickly did learn to, to drag. And that dragging, it's, it's even easier on a slick floor. Um, it's not good for dogs to do this, partly because it will cause um, sores under their knees if they do too much of it. They really load a lot of weight onto their front legs and that can leave them quite sore. So it's not an ideal way to move. Um, and as I said, you know, they can end up with a habit of dragging. And the way that works, see, um, if you think back to what was happening with our dog. So if, if you've got a dog in this situation with, with paralyzed hind legs, and fairly normal front legs and they've got IVDD. So in that case, the, the problem is likely to be in the middle of the back here. And um, in general, the, a dog affected as badly as that will have some quite severe damage to their spinal cord. And as they recover, the inflammation will start to go down and some of the damage may, may heal and resolve in the first few days to weeks, that's fine. But we may still be left with some incredibly badly damaged nerve cells. They may even just be torn right through um, and they're not going to repair. Um, these nerve cells, they don't just repair themselves. Um, but what can happen is over time, so we've got, I've, got, I've got a diagram here with a nerve cell with its long, long process that's designed for carrying information. That's an axon and a cell body here. And one nerve cell can start to grow these fibrous thin processes called nerve sprouts. And eventually these nerve sprouts may meet up with the nerve sprouts from another nerve cell. Or perhaps some of the nerve sprouts might just go nowhere. <laughs> um, but with the ones that do meet up, they, they can form these connections called synapses so that the electrical impulses carrying the messages can actually get from one cell to another. I'm going in the opposite way to the arrows. I think this was designed to go that way in my diagram. So we could get information going from one cell to another and the body can actually reorganize its nervous pathways so that cells join up to form a new pathway. Um, that enables the dog to start moving again over time. Um, and the body, it reinforces those um, nerve pathways that seem to be useful to the dog. So if the dog finds that um, maybe he gets or she gets rewarded with food or with praise every time he does something, or he manages to hurry across the room in a certain way and greet somebody and, and really enjoy that process. And if that happens over and again, um, then that pathway, that, that nerve pathway that's encoding for that is going to get reinforced and strengthened. You may get no, more nerve connections forming stronger synapses. Um, and in that way, that's one way in which learning happens and habits can form. Um, now, we want the right habits to form. We don't want to reinforce the nerve pathways for dragging. We actually want to reinforce the ner nerve pathways for walking. And it, to start with, is going to involve sort of the dog pushing themselves up to a standing position or holding a standing position. Those are all good coordinated movements that we want to reinforce. 
um, but dragging it's not a it's not a halfway step to walking it's actually kind of going down the wrong path um, so to avoid dragging best thing to do is use your lead harness and sling when your dog is active outdoors so that you're getting them up even if it feels like your dog is just a puppet and you're just putting them in this position it's actually really valuable for them because their body is learning they can be this way up on all four paws and even if they're not yet using their hind legs even if they're just floppy at the back end unlike this dog in the photo they'll actually have to use their core muscles here to some extent um, they are using some muscles and their body's just experiencing being in that position and that's helpful and they're not just dragging themselves about outdoors. Also um, carry them when needed so don't just leave them to wander about um, if you need to get over some slick flooring or get from one place to another quickly just carry them. Avoid the slick flooring because it's so easy to drag over slick flooring and really difficult to, to walk over slick flooring. It's just it, it doesn't have the grip for paws to push against it and not slip uh, slip over. And finally, when they're indoors, confine them. And that way, if you come into the room or the doorbell rings or something exciting happens, your dog isn't going to actually drag itself across the room and get that kind of learning, bad learning experience of succeeding in dragging themselves about all over the place. Of course, if you do confine them to a crate or pen, they, they'll still drag themselves a bit perhaps within that space, um, but it will only be a very short distance and then I'll have to stop and turn round. And it's not going to be a slick floored space so it's not going to feel like a really easy thing to do so it, it really won't form that easy habit that they'll get from just sliding about in the kitchen here's an example of a pen suitable for early recovery um, many dachshunds and actually many french bulldogs do very well in an open-topped pen not all of them do so we if your dog is expected to try and escape if they're the type of dog who doesn't respect barriers then they'll be better off in a very large crate um but here we have a pen um it's got bedding on the bottom one important thing here is we've got water and food in the pen so this pen it's like the dog's special little world, their whole world really, apart from their, their toilet breaks. Um, they've got what they need in there. Um, it's not a good idea to have your dog kind of resting in the pen and then let loose to go and eat their food in the middle of the kitchen floor um, because they're going to sort of move towards it in not the most ideal way. And anything might happen while they're eating or drinking, perhaps the doorbell might ring um so have them all set up for what they need to do within the pe within the pen itself what i recommend you do if possible is start with a relatively small floor area for the pen um for around the first three weeks or so of recovery and then extend the pen to a larger area. If you're using a pen, you can just put in extra panels. Um, if you're using a crate, it's it's not so easy because I don't ex you know I don't expect you to 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 buy two crates. Um, but perhaps you could just pad pad get a very very large crate and pad it out a bit more at the edges in the early stages of recovery. Um, so in the early stages, now I must say this dog's got a very very large amount of bedding. <laughs> This was a cold time of year and Dachshunds do like bedding and warmth, but you don't necessarily need this much. Um, what's also happening here is this dog was very, very weak, um, had been affected by the most severe type of IVDD and had lost deep pain sensation. Um, and this um, rolled, very big rolled blanket is actually bolstering this dog up to some extent um, 
in order to kind of look at us and engage with us. So in a way that's quite nice, but we don't always need quite as, as a much bedding as this. Um, but that this is basically that that's one pen and then the same pen extended after three weeks. And here we have a sleeping area. And then we have a standing or exploring area where this dog couldn't yet walk. But some dogs, even in that situation, they actually pull themselves out and they go and start looking around. And we've got this rolled towel edge there. Roll, uh, these are actually bolster cushions, but you could use rolled towels to provide a soft edge. And then you've still got plenty of room here for standing or exploring. So some dogs do take their first steps in their pen um, or they get out onto this area and they push up and stand and then just kind of flop down again. That's fine. So this is after three weeks in general, but be guided by your vet. In some cases, this setup is appropriate sooner. Occasionally, it's best left until a bit later. Um, this, by the way, was an off cut of carpet and it's all laid on. There's some non slip matting under the whole thing so that nothing slips. Um, do be a little bit careful. Some dogs will chew anything you put in the pen. So just keep an eye on the situation. Be prepared to remove things if needed and simplify. Here's some more examples of non-slip flooring. This is on the right. This is another dog who had the most severe form of IVDD, had lost deep pain sensation. And as you can see, he's up and standing and he actually took some of his first steps in the pen. Um, his owner was putting food dispensing toys in the corners of the pen and he's really he, he loves food and he loves games. So this was a great approach for him. That's just simply a rug there. Um, this dog is chewing on a Kong. Um, by the way, for IVDD, I would postpone using them for at least the first three weeks um, because sometimes they do bounce and roll up a bit unpredictably and some dogs are just a little bit a bit too enthusiastic with them so just for safety um, don't give them in the first three weeks or so anyway this dog is settling down nicely with her Kong um, she's got here it's an old yoga mat which makes a sort of great base surface and then there's a bath mat, um, which is good both for lying on and standing on. Tip number five, um, help them learn to stand. So we, we want our dogs to learn to walk, but be aware they'll probably stand before they can walk. So think about you know, learning to stand, uh, learning to walk, it's um, a series of little achievements. Um, and there are different ways of um, helping your dog learn to stand. Um, so one of them, uh, I would generally try and keep your dog distracted from in front. Um, well, basically what you need to do is just support your dog in a standing position with your hands. Um, and I, I generally distract the dog from in front with food. It could be as simple as you just help them keep a standing position while they're eating. This would be one exception where you can actually get them out onto a non-slip rug to, to eat that you don't need to necessarily get into the pen with them for this. Um, and you can see here I'm giving this dog incredibly light support um, because he's actually quite strong. Um, here we've got someone hand feeding a reward while the dog is supported. I'm, I'm missing a picture here. Let me go on a slide. Um, so I'm going to go on the slide and come back. Let's go on a few slides and come back. <laughs> so the other way that in which you can support your dogs is to have a licky mat in front of them as they're standing. And that is an incredibly practical thing to do. Um, I found it so useful, especially during the COVID um, epidemic when people were stuck at home on their own and they couldn't get a second person to help them and they could just simply put up a licky mat. But actually, it's a really good thing to do um, because 
you know even if even if there are two of you this is a very practical way in which to get your dog's head in a natural position up here and they're really focused um, and you can smear onto that licky mat wet dog food if your dog eats wet dog food you could use um, something like liver paste which in this country a good brand would be Arden Grange for example it's not too high in calories it's about 15 calories per teaspoonful um, so that's much much better than using peanut butter <laughs> uh, which is much too calorific um, but do just use a smear of it or if you want something really low calorie go for um, uh, cook some vegetables like carrots or broccoli courgettes puree them um, if you're really keen, you could even put them into an ice cube tray and get them out one by one for your dog's standing sessions. So um, let's just go back to the previous slides. That picture had been missing from here. So just to recap, get your dog focused on some food, whether it's on a licky mat, in a dog bowl or fed from someone's hand working with a friend and you just support them in a standing position start it off just for a very short period it it may just need to be 10 seconds to start with especially if they're quite weak and then you can build it up maybe to a minute at a time give them as much support as needed every dog is different so if your dog is really weak you may need to actually support them, like give them really hold their full weight so they can't fall, like you're holding a sack of potatoes, hand underneath. Some people put their hand between the hind legs of the dog, but generally hand underneath is, I would say that's gonna give the most secure support. Once your dog is a bit stronger, then you may find you can support them with a hand on each side of their haunches. Go directly behind your dog and then you can help keep them straight. So you may find that what happens is the dog's not actually toppling downwards, but they're sort of swaying from side to side. If you don't help them, they'll kind of sway from side to side and maybe just fall over to one side. So you can just have a hand on each side, like in this um, this one in the middle here and just keep your dog central and at the top um, this person has got their hands really cupped around the dog's haunches they're giving them some support at the bottom the dog's actually holding herself up now she's a bit stronger and just needs really a hand there as a guide because if we completely leave her on her own she sways to one side and topples over so there's a hand on each side, just keeping that dog central. And you may get, to, you will hopefully get to the stage where your dog can actually stand on their own. Um, when you first try this, hover your hand underneath or have your hands right there ready to catch them. Don't just suddenly take your hands away. Don't have them fall. Um, it really knocks their confidence. So don't just let go of them. When they're done with their standing, lower them gently to the floor as well. Don't just let them fall. When they're standing, um, once you've got them into that position on all fours, look at their paws and check they're the right way up because your dog might not know which way up their feet are. So, of course, this one on the left that paws upside down, it's knuckled. It should be this way up on the right. And to turn the paw the correct way up or to move it to the correct position. So if you're going to do that, you'll actually need to lift that foot up and put it in the right in the right position. And before you lift that foot up, do please put a hand under your dog's belly because you don't want them to you don't want them to fall, but also you don't want to really knock their confidence by suddenly whisking one foot up into the air unexpectedly that's really disconcerting for them so even if they're strong enough um do put a hand underneath so they 
um, feel supported. If you're moving a paw, uh, lift it with your thumb on the top of the paw and then sort of lift it slowly and then put it back in the right place. So thumb goes on the top of the paw. That's different to when we're working with horses. Um, we lift horses and dogs feet in a different way. On the right here, we've just got a dog standing very much four square and that, that's great. Just practicing standing four square. Um, this dog can stand. She doesn't need a lot of support here. She can she can manage this, um, but she wasn't doing it on her own. Her, her owner had to actually initially get her into that position and then straighten her and then she could hold it. And her owner is doing a great job of having a hand as a guide on each side um, so that she doesn't sway. So you're aiming to have a leg at each corner. One, two, three, four, really with a, a paw, hind paw under each hip. And as I mentioned before, if you've got a paw that's maybe way out to the side or crossed over or way behind the dog, you could actually bring that paw to where it should be, just under the dog's hip. But if you do that, do put your hand underneath your dog, your other hand underneath the dog to support them first. OK, that's a lot of talking about standing practice. Let's have a bit of a look at it. This is um, I'll play this video in a moment. This is a dog who actually by the time the video was taken, he could stand a bit on his own. He wasn't quite doing it on his own. So his own is just bringing him back to the centre, correcting his position, correcting his balance a little bit. And you'll also do, see her doing something called poor sequencing which is where she picks up one paw and places it back down and she picks up the other hind paw and places it back down and then she repeats that. So it sort of goes right foot steps on the spot, left foot steps on the spot, right foot steps, left foot steps, all on the spot. Let's play the video. So she's just placing that left foot now she's just having him stand there and she's just really using her hands as guides. She's sort of stroking his weight back, actually, because he's tending to lean forward onto those front legs. It's a bit of a cheat. As she lifts the paw and places it, so she's got a hand under his belly. Is that it? Yeah, that's played. So that's it's it's really it's not a it's not very exciting to see it's basically it's a dog just standing still and someone's just adjusting their balance that's brilliant that's really good standing practice you'll find um so standing practices in that book with all the details about you know adjusting their paws um there's a series of exercises in the book that are described one of them is paw sequencing uh we've put that in the book quite early on in this in the series of exercises I put in there you know if if you're keen to do more than just standing practice you could add in these exercises one by one once your dog is confident and once you feel you know you're happy with what you're doing check with a physiotherapist first if you're not sure um Paw sequencing, I've put that quite early on so that's the one way that you step your dog's feet one at a time and the reason I put that early on is I do find it's relatively easy for dogs owners to get the hang of um, in many cases quite early on. It sort of makes sense to people. Um, however, don't overdo it. Don't sort of walk their feet on the spot for a whole minute, because if you keep lifting the hind legs, then your dog is actually going to lean more and more on their front legs and sort of actually it's going to be counterproductive you in a way you want them to stand a lot on those hind legs so the standing is really important and you can also help them to sit and to get up from sit and to lie down in an organized way and it's all described in my book um it would just be too much to go through it all today um but these are all helpful things to do. And, and the sitting is quite a tricky thing for 
untrained owners to just start doing. So this is why I've put it a little bit further on in the book. So you have a uh, go at doing some other exercises first. Okay, so just to kind of sum up with the standing practice, safety is really important. Only try and do it on non-slip footing, like carpet or non-slip matting. You could do it on short grass outside if the weather's nice and dry. Obviously, keep really good control of your dog um, if you take them outside for this. Um, have them wear a harness. It's very useful to act as a grab handle if they start to kind of lean forward too much or rush forward. Or again, if the doorbell rings, funny things happen. You can just get hold of that harness and slow your dog down. I do recommend that you do any exercises at floor level only, if at all possible. These dogs, they are obviously they're uncoordinated. They are quite prone to having falls if we're not careful. So you have to be really careful. Um, like if you put them on a raised surface, you have to really have your hands on them at all times so they don't slip off the edge. Um, if there, there are very occasional times when, you know, an owner just can't bend down to the floor and they decide to do things on a tabletop. If so, I really strongly recommend that you get a second person to, to, to be there at the same time so that you're not trying to, so just so you have an extra pair of hands and definitely put down a non-slip cover on that table. But much better is working at floor level. Support your dog as much as needed. Of course, don't just let them fall. And get help if needed. So in many cases, it's just a matter of just asking your partner or a friend or neighbour to kind of be the, the person with the with the food at the front end. Um, if you've got a big dog, they can be really tricky to work with. You might actually need even three people to do these exercises. Um, so definitely get help there. And um, don't hesitate to ask for help from a physiotherapist. If you have a good one living fairly, no uh, based fairly locally to you, um, I can recommend that because they will uh, assess your dog and they will work out precisely how to do these exercises best for your dog. And then, you know, you could ask them to, to really show you what to do at home so that you can continue the good work between their sessions. So here we are, the, the final tip for today, which is making a gradual transition to walking without a sling. So, you know, everything's gradual during recovery and you don't just want to take that sling away. So you may find when you're doing sling walking. Now, in some cases, these some of these dogs, they start with their hind legs are completely floppy. It's like, like the legs of a rag doll. So they may start, that's not the, I, I, I've not got a photo of that here, but some of my cases, they start with completely floppy hind legs. And then after some time, they start to step with those legs, but they can't walk without help. And then eventually you find, actually they're standing a little bit with, with not so much support. And they're clearly, they're stepping quite strongly. Um, so maybe they're ready to, to transition to not using a sling. Check with your vet if you're not sure, or a physiotherapist. So the way to transition to not using a sling. So raise that sling while they're walking. And then when your dog stops and stands still, have a go at lowering the sling. The tip here is when they're, when you're lowering the sling, slow your dog from the lead because if they do suddenly shoot forward they're at some risk of just toppling over <laughs> so you'll find they'll be able to stand without the sling support before they're ready to walk without the sling support let's have a, a look at a video this is darcy doolittle this was actually very shortly after she came from home from hospital and her owners were really just working out how to use this sling system. So they're doing very well. Um, and they were just deliberately lowering that sling as Darcy stops walking. 
and raising it as she starts walking, lowering it there. And you can see she's she's not great on her feet, but she's actually not falling. She's weaker on that left hind leg than on the right hind leg. And there she's standing well, and it's always nice to see. Um, it's nice to see during a little exercise session, the dog actually standing and stepping a little bit, bit better as that exercise session goes on. So that clip was about 35 seconds and she had been doing this for a few seconds before the video started. And often it's like over a minute, you see they improve and then it might be after a minute or so, they actually start to get weaker and they could do with a rest. Um, and then eventually you'll find that your dog is actually walking with reasonably good steps, even when you're lowering the sling. Um, and then you can have a go at walking without the sling. Now, before we talk about how to do that, I'll just point out this, this lead technique. So you sort of have to have be ready to use this lead technique. I do recommend if your dog is still quite weak. Um, so what you need to do is have your lead in two hands. So you've got one hand with the um, one hand with your thumb going down the lead towards your dog, and the other hand is holding the handle end of the lead out of the way. When you start walking without a sling, it is much easier to use a longer lead. And when you're using the sling, you really could do with just having a short lead. Otherwise, you've got too much. Uh, length of the lead just kind of dangling or having to be gathered up in your hand. So once you dispense with that sling, a longer lead is best. Hold it in two hands. And this is really important. Position yourself so that you're a little bit behind your dog. You could be level with their tail, but don't get in front of their tail. And that's going to help your dog keep their weight better over their hind paws. Um, because what they will try to do if they are still a touch weak in their hind paws is they're going to throw their weight forwards and down and they might just try and scrabble forward with their front paws. But keep a little bit behind your dog and keep the lead pointing back from its clip. So that's the, the clip that goes to the harness and from there that bit of the lead goes backwards a little bit towards your hand. And that's just going to encourage your dog to slow down. It'll slow your dog's front end so their hind paws have a chance to step. And then finally, walk on your dog's weakest side. So if your dog tends to knuckle or drag or scuff their left hind leg more than their right hind leg, so that means their left hind leg is the weaker one, walk on their left side. And you can check that with your physiotherapist if you have one. You can check that with your vet if you like, um, which is your dog's weakest side. It might vary, it might change from week to week. When you start walking your dog without a sling, um, I recommend you make the first attempt really short. We're talking here about dogs who are kind of finding it quite hard to walk. I'm, I'm aware there are some dogs who just very quickly get up on their feet and it seems to be with no help and off they go. But many dogs do need some assistance to learn to walk. So if your dog has been, you know, they're finding it difficult, they've been recovering over, a, 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 say, a week or more, um, make that first attempt at walking just about six foot, no more than that. So it's um, not too difficult to challenge. Keep them really slow from the lead. So this sounds, it's, it isn't intuitive, but you may find that your dog actually tries to hurry forward because they're throwing their weight onto their front legs and trying to scrabble forward. So slow them down from, so their front end slows and their hind paws have a chance to step. But you do actually want them to be motivated. Otherwise, what they'll do is just stand and maybe just even lie down. <laughs> so you want them to try and go somewhere. Um, you may find that you really need to set them up with some food on the finishing line. 
if you put food on the finishing line then do keep do keep them that, that do keep them slow so you're going to they'll be motivated they'll be ready to go they'll start going but then you slow them down so that they do it slowly keep the lead, keep the lead pointing back for all the reasons i've already said to slow their front end um, and you'll build you'll build the whole thing up gradually let's play this video so you can see the process so this little dog is bean it's being put very gently in a standing position. She's got food on the finishing line. And her owner is very cautiously, you can see how slow her owner's stepping. And I wouldn't try and go faster than that because this is just a little dachshund with short legs. So that actually was not particularly slow for a dachshund who's just learning to walk. Let's play it again. Um, so, Firstly, she's been put carefully on the ground. I know she's really unsteady on her feet. This this dog had so many uh, problems actually at the same time, different medical problems. She was very weak and she'd also been recovering for a while. So very, very unsteady on her feet, but actually she could walk. And it's um, if you've got a dog who's as unsteady on their feet as that, so what, I, what, what we did there, we walked to just six foot and then the next day we had a go at doing it again. And we just built it up over a couple of weeks until she was walking for much longer and she was getting up on her own and walking walking as well. Um, so uh, in a very wobbly dog, just, just do a little bit each day. Um, as I said, some dogs just recover much quicker than that. So be guided by your physiotherapist um, or you can talk to your vet about this. Um, but in general, it's that, you know, that's just that six foot for a very weak dog can be tiring. So just be aware, you, just little, li a little bit of activity is best during this learning process. And yeah, be aware they need to walk before they start to trot or run. And always remember, just a non-slip footing, do use a harness and lead and walk on their weakest side. And it's all in the book. <laughs> um, thank you so much for listening. Uh, shall we have a time for questions? Marianne, thank you very much. I don't know how you managed to distill it down into six tips with all <laughs> that advice that's in there, but well done on that. And uh, some really important points about motivating your dog. Uh, those of us with Dachshunds will obviously appreciate that the motivate them with food is going to be a really successful strategy in there as well. So uh, well done for that. I'm going to stop the recording now and we'll do the Q&A session uh, without the recording going. So let me just stop that. And